Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Wonderful day. Absolutely. Looking quite handsome there, uh, all dressed up like that. That's very, very nice. Thank you for uh, uh, agreeing to chat with me. No worries. Thank no you. Worries. Thank you very much. I appreciate the compliment. Absolutely. Please uh, tell us your name and share a little bit about yourself that will help us get to know you that you feel comfortable sharing. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Tony Marshall. I am the son of Command Sergeant Major Robert E. Marshall and Janie Marshall, two fantastic parents who uh, gave me gave me the world. Uh, got uh, got grew up in a in a wonderful household. Uh, you hear so many times that uh, you know folks come up and challenge households, and uh, that that was not my experience. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've, I've had a lot of opportunities placed in front of me. Uh, I currently run uh, two businesses. One is a real estate holding business, and the other is a, is a, a cybersecurity services firm. That we've been in business for about 22 years. But Can you thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about both of your businesses? So what does the real estate holding company do, and, and how, how do people find it, and, and what services do you provide through that company? Uh, through the real estate holding company, uh, I is what I buy and hold my real estate, uh, and I, I buy it. I, uh, it's residential real estate. We rent out apartments, so I've got five apartment buildings, and uh, you know I've been in the uh, in that line of business for about thirty nine years. Uh, I was uh, fortunate at a young age to uh, to meet some people who kind of put their arms around me and gave me some good advice, and I bought my first apartment building when I was twenty one. And uh, we've just uh, been buying and acquiring and selling and holding on to real estate and, uh, yeah. through that business. I just think that's a great area that, uh, that a lot more young people need to, need to better understand. And that is probably the easiest and best way to, uh, to acquire wealth is through real estate. And do you have, uh, is there something where you can help or provide some kind of uh, guidance on how young people, how any, I guess, any person gets into that area. I, I, you know, we hear a lot about flipping, which I, I, I think I understand what that is. But, but is there some, some, some tools or something that you could provide for people to understand this? Uh, there's nothing that I do systematically, uh, constantly, but off and on, I provided uh, uh, just training classes uh, where we sit down with young people and kind of help them to understand. Uh, you know, at uh, one point in my career, we went out and did a, a presentation to some young people who had some challenge beginnings and uh, and sat down and talked to them about it. Rather than going up and taking a can of paint and spraying, so spraying your name on it and saying it belongs to you, you know, put, put your name on the deed. When you put your name on the deed, that's when it, that's when it really makes an impact. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is that all of us, you know, the very nature of what we do as, as you know, we start off at a young age, we have a lot of energy, we have a lot of strength, and we think that's going to last forever. As we mature and get a little bit older, our bodies start to fail us, and we start to slow down. And we go from active income to passive income. <laughs> so when you start off, you, you're, you're full of ener energy, and you don't have a whole lot of passive income. So what you want to start doing is taking some of your active income and moving it all over and saving it so you can develop passive income. So as your body starts to slow down, you can rely on the passive income to keep on making money for you. And that's one of the, one of the wonderful things about real estate. When I hear about uh, young people that are, let's say you get ready to save for, for your college fund for your child, the best thing that you could do is to take the money that you would set, set aside and buy a small house, mm -hmm. buy a small house, rent it out, let people pay the mortgage on it. When you look at what the appreciation is over an 18 year period, it will more than cover the cost of, of college. So it is the best way than rather than pulling out 10 or 15% of your income and, and, uh, and trying to keep up with these mounting bills. Same thing for your retirement. Buy one house for each one of your kids' education, buy another house for your own, uh, or maybe several properties for your own uh, retirement. But there's no better way to accumulate wealth, at least in my, my opinion. I think that uh, when we look at uh, how people create wealth, 71% of people's wealth is developed through real estate. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it, it's one of those things that uh, if we can 
parents have it. Parents teach their, teach their children what they know, and unfortunately, these are the messages that many of our, our of our parents just don't know about. We just need to share it with. Them. Right, and, and I hope you will. Uh, what What came to mind was McDougal Terrace in Durham, right? Yes. How many of those families know how to get out of those uh, public housing? You know, and uh, where is the education system? So the the housing authority, I don't think it's in their agenda to move people out of the housing authority no. but people need to know you know and and i've always thought that renting is a is a bad game it's a bad game because you're never going to gain anything you're constantly giving away your money and you're not going to gain anything so i i do hope you will find some way to 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 reach out and and help you know further this because i think your point is absolutely wonderful because if you go back to um uh, reconstruction, where we're supposed to get 40 acres on a mule, and we haven't gotten a mule or the acres. So, or the acre. <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, I do think that, you know, real estate is the key. And, and if you look at wealth, especially in the 1% wealthiest people, they own a lot of real estate. You know, they own a lot of land and, and things yes. like that. So, we as a black and brown community need to know how to do that too. And, you know, especially if we don't have good credit, how, how, do, how do we get there? Or we don't have enough money to buy an apartment building or even to buy a house, you know, for yes. that matter, you know, so I, 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 I hope you will, will figure out something how to do that. So can you tell us a little bit about your cybersecurity company, please? So innovative systems group, more affectionately known as ISG, um, is a, uh, is a 22-year-old uh, IT company. Uh, before we started uh, ISG, uh, I ran the East Coast division of a, uh, of a software company that was based out of California. Uh, we did really good work, uh, and the customers across the country decided that, you know, graduates started coming to us and saying, hey, you know, we'll have the company do things, but I want it run out of the East Coast office. Mm -hmm. And um, we were... We did things a little differently. I always invested a lot of time in training my people and being very honest. Uh, honesty and, and integrity in business is, uh, if people recognize the fact that you're honest and you've got a great deal of integrity, they'll always come back. And you just can't put, uh, you just can't underestimate the amount of value that you get from integrity. Right. And you know, if you stand in front of a customer and, and, and it's a $30,000, project, tell the customers $30,000. Right. You know, uh, we had salespeople that would stand in front of them and tell them it was a $20,000 project. And then you'd get halfway into it and realize, okay, it's not going to be done. You got to come up with, ten, with, uh, with more money or you've lost everything. And they felt like that was a good way to go because at least the people would start the project and, you know, they'd be too far into it to quit. And I said, no, that's not what you do. You look them in the eye, you tell them it's going to be 30000 you stay about your you make sure you're good at what you do and you deliver it for that price. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, the next one, it takes away the anxiety. They can trust you. They'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. So what we started to find was many more customers from around the country started coming to us. So we'd have, we'd have customers out of Vancouver that would say, want to do the project, want it done out of, out of the East Coast office. But it was just getting to be too much of a challenge to, to keep on traveling and uh, you know, I've got my people traveling all over the country. It was just too hard to keep up with things. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so at some point, it was just really difficult. At the time we were based in DC, I told them I needed to get to a better, uh, to give my people a better cost of living, a better standard of living. Traffic was tough in DC, wonderful. DC is a fantastic place, just love it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's, an expen it's expensive to be there. So we moved down to North Carolina, which was wonderful. If you can take a DC salary and bring it down to uh, North Carolina, you know, every everybody came down, everybody was happy. Uh, what we uh, so uh, that worked out real well uh, for a, for a time, and then our customers started coming to us and saying, "Hey, we like you guys. We're not too crazy about your company." Mm -hmm. And uh, so at that point, we you know reached an agreement with our company, and we kind of separated. Mm -hmm. Now. Uh, the one, the great part about that is we started the company with some, uh, started the ISG with some wonderful customers. Georgia Pacific was a longtime customer, uh, Warehouser, Smurf and Stone, who at the time was the largest paper manufacturer in the world. So, you know, we started the company with these fantastic companies that uh, 
that were already on our books. So, I mean, it was wonderful. So, uh, you know, we thought, hey, what could go wrong? This is fantastic. But because of the way that we were that we were structured and we started with so many great customers, we really didn't have a sales force. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was we ran into some some tough times as uh, as projects started to, to fade off. And you really do have to go out there and start beating the bushes and get people to know who you are. But uh, but we but we did that for, for a while and we were focused in the force products uh, area. Uh, all of our customers were folks who cut down trees and made boxes. And that's what they did. Mm -hmm. uh, which was wonderful until all the there was a lot of consolidation in the industry and all of our customers started to go broke. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is the book, uh, Who Moved My Cheese? Well, uh, everybody loved us, but everybody, all, all the people that loved us were broke. So we reinvented ourselves about seven years ago and focused uh, primarily on cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And um, cybersecurity is a, is a fantastic field. Uh, it right now, according to the Federal Department of Labor, depending upon who you talk to, there's either a half million or a million unfilled cybersecurity jobs today. So tremendous need for need for talent, but and everybody's shopping for talent. Everybody's fishing. We say everybody's uh, is is uh, is is casting a line and and uh, fishing in the pond, but nobody's stocking the pond. Right. So what we did was we formed an apprenticeship program which uh, focused primarily on, how, on creating a pathway for people to learn and understand cybersecurity. Excellent. And, you know, I always say cybersecurity is a little different because it's, it's kind of like being an airline pilot. You know, everybody wants a pilot that's got experience, but nobody wants to fly with you when you're trying to get it. So, so uh, what we did was we came up with an environment that gave us the ability to educate and train individuals and make sure they knew what they were doing before you put them on the job. Yeah, excellent. So, so let me ask you a question about your work. So the businesses that you have, how are you seen and responded to as a black man in two significant markets? It's, uh, it's, it's interesting in the real estate market, uh, one of the things that I think that that uh, that I would challenge everybody, it, it, you know, unfortunately, when you're black in America, one the, of the things that I say we always have to overcome is what I refer to as the assumption of incompetence. Absolutely. You know, it's you know when you when you show up, everybody just assumes that you know absolutely nothing. Nothing. You know, I don't. Uh, I've got a piece of uh, piece of property that I look to uh, put on the market, and uh, when I did. Uh, and I told some I told the realtor I wanted to sell it. He came back, and the price that he that uh, that he told me my property was worth was probably about seventy percent of its value. Right. And you know, it's just the assumption that you don't know what you're doing. Absolutely. There was another another instance when we were moving down from D.C. I decided to sell all my property in D.C. and uh, buy property in in uh, here in North Carolina. When I did, uh, I sold the property. I put the finances in trust with the bank and I came down here and looked around for property. Uh, and that process is called a 1031. It's a pretty common practice, but, uh, but I, so the bank was holding my cash. They didn't have to guess as to whether I had money. They had it right. deposited and for tax purposes, you know, to avoid a large tax bill, I had to buy more properties. Mm -hmm. So I identified five properties that we coddled together in a deal and I wanted to, to buy them. And I was, was buying, got a really good deal on them. I was buying them at 60% of value. Mm -hmm. Very, very happy with it. You know, significant down payment that I was putting on it, about, uh, about 35% of, of the uh, cost of the property I was putting down on. When I took it to one of the local banks, the person told me that uh, they turned, they turned the deal down. Now, I already had my IT business doing business with this bank. Mm -hmm. And I've already uh, put a very large sum of money in their bank in trust. Mm -hmm. They turned me down for the loan and I wanted to know why. If I've got excellent credit, I've got money in your bank, you know me, I've been doing business with you. And the person in front of me said, well, uh, you know, Mr. Marshall, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, 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 the banker, they, uh, the underwriters want to see you have more, uh, more experience in this line of business. 
Now, mind you, I bought my first apartment building before this, this young man was born. And I, I sat there, you know, I, I was furious. I, I mean, I, 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 I've got a lot of things going. I just never thought that this would be a problem that I had was to, was to get financing. There is, this, this was a layup. This was just too easy to finance. Uh, out of frustration, I just told, told him, write a check. I'm closing out all of my accounts with the exception of the trust account. I couldn't, couldn't do that without some serious tax ramifications. And I moved my, moved my relationship somewhere else. Uh, to their credit, and I can't can't say enough about uh, Miss Andrea Harris at the Institute. She was the one that I called and told her what my problem was, and she helped me to find a, a banker that would give me uh, give me some assistance. I, I, I say that because I can point to so many times in my career when individuals who were older and more seasoned than I was. Mm-hmm. were able to, black folks were able to put their arm around me and show me the direction and help me out. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Miss Harris just died recently and uh, I just cannot say enough wonderful things about her. She was just a spectacular person and uh, she did just wonders for, uh, for me and my business and uh, just helping me to know and understand what to do. But uh, we all need to remember that we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Amen. So, Amen. So I think I think one one of the things that I am I think I'm 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 passionate about advocacy and diversity, but I think the thing that I'm more passionate about is community, right? Yeah. So um, I learned this a long time ago when I started out in IT. You know, black people just were not there, and um, I had a white man sit me down. He's my boss. I've never had anybody other than a white man as my boss. And I had him sit me down one day in his office and I guess he was trying to mentor me or help me. And he said, the most important thing you can do in your career is to create a network of people who will be there for you. If you need a dollar, they'll give you a dollar. If you need a job, they'll help you find a job. If you need a reference or a recommendation, they will do it. And that has been, and I think I said this to you, I have a massive network. And that yeah. is what I have done. Thankfully, I've never had to ask for the dollar. <laughs> Every once in a while, I might need a recommendation or whatever. But community. And I think for black and brown people, we need to understand that. And my community is not black. It's not brown. It's not white. It's not yellow. It's all of that. Yes. All across every spectrum, for people who are presidents and, and 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 high leaders, to people who sweep the floor. I mean, yes. young, old. That's my community, and I think to me, success and what you've described is community, yes. right? You've had people yes. who have have come to your aid. Yes. Young people, and even some of us old fogies need to understand the importance of community, especially if we are going to get roles, if we are going to develop wealth, if we are going to have opportunities to start our own business or whatever it is, we need community. Mm-hmm. And we need community not to form under that, that title of networking, because I don't know what that means. You know, I hear people talk about networking all the time, but to me it means you go to a bar and meet some people and talk to them, and then you disappear or whatever it is. Community are those people who advocate for you, those people who stand up for you, those people who will pick up the phone and call and say, hey, Mr. Marshall, I've got this gal or girl who I think will fit for you. And you say, okay, I trust this person. I have a relationship. My social capital with them is good and I trust them. You know, that kind of thing. So I think that's really important. I think you've described that very well. And thank you for that. Sure. So, So my next question is, did you see the video of Mr. Floyd? I did. I did. I, have, I didn't watch the whole thing. And I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I just could not. I just, you know, the thing is that the frustration or the rage that that builds up in me is just not healthy. Right. And, and, and I've heard a lot of people say that, but did it, what, what you able, were able to see or hear or whatever, what reaction or what, what action did it bring to mind for you? The one thing that it that uh, that it really kind of brought to to me 
is that, uh, and the, let, me, let me tell you what I had to, had to stop myself from doing, is getting angry to the, to the point that, well, I just can't, it's, it's too difficult for me to explain the anger and frustration that I see with that type of behavior. Anyone that would assert themselves into a, a situation in a way where they would just be a bully, we heard that hear that term constantly, a bully. When you get, you know, when 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 an individual who feels like they've got a certain le level of power and they exert it to these outrageous levels, you know, you notice that uh, that the coward that did that never would do, would do that with his, with that man's hands un uncuffed. Right. You know, uh, and some of the, you know, it. I, I struggle sometimes because of my thought and some of the interactions that I've had with the uh, with the police. Um, you know, at a young age, uh, as I said, I was pretty fortunate. Uh, my, uh, I did most of my high school overseas, and uh, my father was in the military. And because of that, uh, we had the opportunity to take more classes than the average high school person did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always remember we were riding in the car. We were, we were living in Germany, and uh, I guess uh, through the military system, they give you access to additional classes because since these students move around so much, you can sometimes get trapped in situations where you don't, uh, where you don't have, uh, where you, you get behind. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, saying uh, talking to my, one of my, uh, my brother, and I said, nine classes in a day, who in the world would ever take nine classes instead of six? My father said, you would, <laughs> and, and made us take. And because of that, uh, I was able to graduate from high school at 16. I was able to, uh, to, uh, Go to go to college, and uh, I finished college at uh, at uh, 19. Was in a professional position at a pretty early age. Was working at a hospital in uh, the D.C. area, and ascended to a managerial position at age 21. Uh, every night I came home from the hospital. Every night mm -hmm. the police would follow me and stop me. Every night. Wow. Every night. Uh, you know. Let me see your license, your registration. You know, do you live here? Just like I did yesterday. <laughs> Show them the license I go through. You know, meanwhile, because I look, was in a, a managerial position, but, uh, but I looked young, I always wore a tie. So I'm the only one running around in the hospital with a lab coat and a tie <laughs> because I wanted people to understand. You know, I was in a managerial position, even though I looked young enough to be a candy striker. Right. Uh, and, uh, and no matter how I dressed, no matter how I carried myself, they would always stop me. I filed several letters of complaint and it, it just never went anywhere. But I just said, you know, it's a way of, doesn't make a difference. It's a way of doing business, not a problem. I came home one night and uh, this officer, not only did he stop me, but he took his car and blocked traffic. And so because of the fact that he had his lights going and blocking traffic, it's causing the scene. Traffic is backing up and people are looking out. My neighbors are looking out the window at me and things like that. He stopped me. I've got no problems. I'm a law abiding citizen. Mm -hmm. And we were standing there and, I, and, you know, I asked him, I said, you know, officer, what's this all about? And he said, well, someone robbed some, someone up the street. Now, why should that bother him? He, he met me at the end of town and followed me all the way down the street. He knew where I was going. And, it, you know, it's the same pattern every night. So I, I, you know, at that point, I, I just laughed and I said, uh, I hope whoever it was was probably wearing more comfortable shoes and, and uh, wasn't carrying this briefcase because that right. probably would have slowed him, slowed him down. Uh, I, I doubt if they look like me. Right. And, and you know, just kind of trying to lighten the situation up. And he said a couple of things that were very extremely disrespectful. <laughs> and uh, and he attempted to insult. And I responded in a way that I was insulted. Mm -hmm. And uh, the situation just, uh, you know, if I went back and we could have froze things at, uh, at one point in time, I would say that there's no way to bring this back into a healthy situation because I stepped very close to him and threatened bodily harm and told him if he reached for his gun that we were gonna have a problem. And the situation was just way, way out of control. At about that time, his sergeant pulled up and the first thing he said, he didn't say a word to me. He said, Elkins, stand down. And it just so happened that uh, the officer, his sergeant, was married to the head nurse at the, uh, at the emergency room. And I'd been over their house for social gatherings. And he knew me well. And he knew that his officer was out of control. 
And, uh, but, you know, outside of that man, you know, that was divine intervention for that officer, for his sergeant to pull up at that time. Yep. But it helped me, it helped me to understand how these interactions can go so bad. So bad. And, you know, the, the thing is that we can ask our kids to try to be, you know, hold on, go along, do what they say. But at some point when they get disrespectful and they, they threaten your manhood, it's hard not to react. So I recognize these are terrible situations and we've got to do something to try to, uh, to keep our, our kids away from them. I've always tried to tell my kids, I said, you know, if something happens, don't call 911, call me. I said, if something happens, please call me, call yeah. me. Yeah. And that worked for us until my son goes to college and uh, he was at in college and uh, they were, he's in honors college, good student, nice kid, good citizen, you know, all of those things. He and his girlfriend are walking, go out to get pizza and they're walking back with their books from the pizza shop. It's about eight o'clock at night. They hear gunshots. My son calls the police. And, you know, I, I, I told him over and over again, call me, call me, call me. Well, when the officer got there, he sees two college students standing there. He makes them lay down on the ground, frisk the two of them. Now, why would they call him? For, you know, I mean, right. you know, and he's, he's angry, he's frustrated, and he had good reason to be. And when I told him, I said, son, why didn't you call me? He said, well, you know, dad, I thought I was doing the right thing. What, what would you have done differently? I said, I would have told you to call the police but I would not have told you to tell them who you are. Right. Because unfortunately, too many of our situations go that way. And unfortunately, what we have to do as a nation, we have to get beyond that. Yeah. There, there should be a uniform code of conduct and it doesn't make a difference who you are or who that officer is, but if he doesn't follow the rules or the codes of conduct, he will have to pay the price, whatever the price is. Law enforcement isn't for only, you know, how can you say you're going to enforce the law, but you're not going to follow the law? I mean, that we, we as a nation need to see the, the, to recognize the fallacy in that. And you can't expect people to respect you if you don't uh, behave in a way that uh, commands respect. Yeah, I, I will tell you, so um, I, I, you sound well, well read and, and very uh, well educated. There is an article that was written about maybe 10 years ago, and it, it is called the PTSD of black genes that over from slavery to this day that we have been traumatized in such a way that our behavior and the way we are able to interact in community in, in our communities is limited because we are so traumatized and if you think about traumatized people their responses and actions are not always logical or reasonable right yes and yes. so when you, when you think just just a week ago a woman and her children are in a car and they lay them down on the ground children i mean i'm not talking about adults teenagers they lie them down on the ground they put handcuffs on them they're laying face down on the ground the mother okay i might be able to be understand that a little bit but these are children. I mean, like middle school, maybe early high school students lay down on the ground. And it wasn't clear ever why, what they had done, but they did. And so when, when you think about trauma, so we've been enslaved, we've had Jim Crow, we've had the Civil War, we've had uh, Civil Rights Act, we've had, you know, Everything you could possibly happen to a, a race of people happened to us. And in 2020, we are still people trying to be part of the society as normal, everyday human beings. Now, what you just said, you're a productive citizen. You know, you're a law-abiding, productive citizen. But you are also something else. You are Black. You are black every day. You're black in the morning. You're black at night. You're black in the, in the, in the wherever. When you go into your office, you're black. When you get in your car, you're black. When you go to the grocery store, you're black. That construct now means that you are susceptible to whatever society believes is true about black. 
So people can look at you with this tie, this successful business, you're, you're doing all these wonderful things, but in, the, in an instant, you are black and you yes. are a threat and your life is expendable simply because you're black. And I think the trauma that we have experienced and continue to experience. So as we talk about diversity and all these other things, we need to go back and think about how do we heal ourselves. And yes. I don't think anyone else is going to heal us, but we need to heal ourselves. And I don't know how that's done. I really don't. Because I can tell you, well, you can see I'm black, but I'm also an angry black woman. That's what I am defined as an angry black woman, because I'm not going to let you speak to me any kind of way. I'm not going to let you treat me any kind of way. And so I'm aggressive, passive aggressive, angry, and every other adjective you could slap on me, I'm that. I'm brilliant. I graduated from college with two and a half degrees in two and a half years, summa cum laude. I got my master's degree in two years. I don't know if it was summa cum laude, but magna cum laude. I got my doctorate degree in four years from start to finish, dissertation and all, at the top of my class. Of, of, of a class, a cohort of 25, two, and I was one of the two, and I was old as hell when I started. I have done so much work in my community, in my field, and I am like you. I am black. I am a threat. I am not seen. I am invisible, voiceless, and valueless. Well, one of the things that I try to do is I, you know, I do know that, uh, that internally, it's difficult for me to pretend like I'm not angry, but I think it's important. Um, you know, I'm, I'm 6'2 and weigh about 220 pounds. And sometimes I realize that it's, I can, I, if, if I reacted in the wrong way, it could be intimidating. And, and that's, that's not what you intend to do. But, but I do realize that sometimes I will get defensive in situations where I don't need to. You know, I often tell the story of a very good friend of mine uh, now who happens to be Caucasian. We were in the gym and I'm working out and every day I'd see this guy and he would stare at me. Wouldn't speak, I'd walk by and I speak to every, everyone. I try to be very cordial to everyone. And I speak to him, he wouldn't say a word, he would just look at me. I'd look, I'd look back, you know, hey, look, I'm not taking a step back from you. And, uh, and you know, at, at, at some point, you know, I remember telling my wife, I said, you know, I might, I think I might end up having to knock this guy out. <laughs> and, uh, and then no. one day, one no. day, he, he just, he walked up to, to me and said, uh, he said, I'm in the gym working hard. One day I'm going to look just like you. And I looked at him and I said, you can work out in here forever, but until you spend a lot of time in the sun, you'll never look like me. And <laughs> later on, I, I started, I said, you know, that was kind of an inter inappropriate comment. But uh, the whole time he said he was always impressed with how hard I worked and that, uh, and things like that. And he, because of it, he would marvel. He'd always watch my workout. He would always try to watch what I do. Did. And uh, he said the reason that he stayed, he was always staring at me when I'd walk by. He said uh, that he didn't hear very well, <laughs> and he and uh, and he didn't see very well. So, uh, so so consequently, and you know, I think about the fact that through, if I did react in by making the assumption that this individual was being aggressive yeah. uh, with me, that things could have ended ended differently. So that I try to be cognizant of the fact that many times we can be predisposed to. So, and many times those things are warranted for us to be angry, but, uh, but the best way forward for everybody involved for us to, is to try to temper that anger. Yeah, but remember that PST is in your DNA, in your genetics. And so remembering, you know, so like I always, I love to hear people talk about black men because they have so much swagger, you know, they have so much style and class, right? And my, my, my husband is beautiful. I mean, like, I don't think no man in the world is a beautiful, my, my husband's swagger and everything about it. I, like, I'd be staring at him sometimes. Like, I wonder how the hell I got him. <laughs> you know, like, damn, that man is just beautiful. But that swagger, that beauty is a threat. To some people. And right. you're right. 
Right. So, so that, and that's really interesting because my, my, I think that I always like to tell people, but one of the things that I thought was so interesting about my upbringing is that during my formative years, we were, we were overseas and, uh, and in Germany, the, the Germans just kind of had an affinity towards blacks. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and many times my white friends would come and say, oh, Tony, can you go downtown? We're going downtown. Can you please come with us? I'd say, you know, guys, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a school night. And, you know, my parents aren't going to allow me to go. Why don't you guys go by yourself? Why do you keep hassling me? They said, well, you know, because Tony, they treat me, they treat us so much better when we're, we're when we're with you. Yes. And we just need, just come down for a little while. Yes. And, you know, so I was treated special because of who I was. And uh, what was interesting, so that kind of gave me a level of confidence. Now, you don't want to be, be cocky, but you felt good about who you were because people wanted to be around you and people wanted to be, be with you. They appreciated your intellect, your, your athleticism, your, all of those things that you were, your style, your race. And then when we came back, it was uh, interesting when we, uh, before I graduated from high school, we, we uh, transferred back to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And people seemed to hate me for exactly those same reasons. <laughs> I remember I was walking in, uh, we had just come back. We had gone, I'd gone to school, met some people, and, and uh, they wanted to say, so, hey, we're going to ride down to Sears. Would you like to ride with us? I said, sure. So we went down to Sears, and we were walking through the store. And uh, somebody said, hey, uh, that guy is following us. So I, I didn't think anything of it. So we were, I just kept shopping. And then after, after a while, I turned around and I, I noticed that he was. So I turned around. I thought he wanted something. And I turned around and I, I said, hey, I said, uh, seems like you're following us. Can, can I help you? He said, uh, he said, yeah, I'm following you. I wanted to make sure that you didn't take something. And, I'm, and, and I was so naive that I did not understand what he meant. Take something. Why would I come in here and start grabbing this stuff and take it up to the register if I was going to take it? And, and it just, it just didn't dawn on me. And it took me a long time. I didn't feel like I, it took me a while to adjust because of the fact that I'd been so used to people treating me like I was special. Right. Now I'm being special, but not in a positive way. Not in a positive way. And then when I looked at some people, you know, another contrasting story, I was in a, in a we had gone to, down to visit some of my mother's family in South Carolina. And uh, I was with one of her cousins. Well, this is this was earlier. So I, I guess at this time, dad had gone to Vietnam and we were back in South Carolina. And at the time, I guess I was probably about maybe nine or 10. And uh, we were in a store with one of my mother's cousins. And he was about 19, 20. But I remember we were in the store and I don't remember what happened, but I just remember that some of the people that came in were very disrespectful to Adam. And, you know, just in terms of the way they were looking at him and the way they were treating him and the things that they said to him. And uh, I remember I was just looking at at, uh, at this guy and he looked at me and said, uh, he said, you know, what are you looking at? And I, I looked at my father always taught me when you speak to adults, you look them in the eye. And I looked him in the eye and I told him nothing. I'm looking at absolutely nothing. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Adam nudges me and he says, uh, you know, don't look that white man in the eye. And, and, you know, I mean, I was, I was so put off and I, I just didn't understand. I was angry and frustrated. I was more angry at Adam. Stand up for yourself. I mean, I've always been told, stick your chest out. You stand up tall. You look people in the eye. You shake, your, shake their hands. You be firm. And, I mean, I got that message drummed into me from the time I could, from, you know, from a little fellow. And uh, it was frustrating to me that he would hold his eyes down and look away. And what are you doing? And it wasn't until adulthood where I started to realize, whereas I led a pretty privileged life and had the had a support system around me that would enable me to look people in the eye and act that way. In the rural South, in the 60s and 70s, you didn't have that same support system. Absolutely. So it was it was inappropriate for me to be as angry and put off as I was with Adam because of the fact that he was living in a different existence than I was. Yeah, you, mu you, must, I, not, you must not be familiar with pig laws. Uh, no. You should Google pig laws. Okay. Black people could not look white people in the face. They could not look up to them. They could not raise their voice to them. And I, I grew up in the rural, so I grew up in a little town called Walterboro, South Carolina, little rural Walterboro. town. You know, sundowners, all this stuff. You could not, I mean, grown men, you know, 70, 80, 60, 
boy, call boy, you know, the N word bannered around like it was, um, you know, like I'm saying, yes, just, you know, you walk by, you know, hey, in, you know, get off the side of the street or whatever it is. You know, you have so many examples of absolute miracle blessings from above. Because yes. when that police officer, uh, you, were, you, were, you were standing face to face, could have killed you. You know, yeah. being in South Carolina, you know, looking somebody in the face and saying nothing, you could have ended up dead. You know, the, the, the stories that our lives tell is how much we have been emasculated, pushed down, and muted. What you have been successful for, and I, if I were you, every moment I wake up, I'd be thank you, thank, thank God, thank you know, just constantly thanking God because what you learned over time is absolutely important and correct. But in yes. practice, it doesn't work that way. It does not work that way, even yes. today. Yes, and you know, and uh, you know, it. I, uh, it's funny that you would say even today because uh, I remember when uh, my oldest son was born. I, you know, uh, I named my oldest son after me. And uh, someone asked me, you know, well, why would you name your son after you? And I said, if I could name every one of my kids after me, I would do a George Foreman to name every one of them after me. Because I, want, I, want, I want people to know and understand that Anthony Marshall, Anthony G. Marshall II has got a support system around him. And if you mess with the second, the first might show up. So, so temper your behavior. And I've seen so many of our young people that, who have been disrespected because of the assumption that they didn't have a support system. Yes. So any label that I could put on them to let to make sure that they that anyone knew that my children had a support system, I'd, I'd put whatever label on them that I could. I did the same now, thing my son, yeah. absolutely. Now my second son, I remember I wanted to give him an, uh, an Afrocentric name. And I, I went back and forth on it. And uh, my big concerns were, that if I gave him an Afrocentric name, would he meet with racial prejudice? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, 20, 25 years from now, surely we would not be dealing <laughs> with these types of things. You know, that son is now 33 and we are certainly dealing <laughs> with, with those, those things. And I am, uh, you know, I have mixed feelings. I, I did not give him an Afrocentric name, but, uh, but, but for those reasons, I was concerned about uh, uh, about racial prejudice, but one of the things that it does, it gives us the assumption that the times that we were we were in were going to gradually get better, and that over time they're going to be better. The March on Washington was 60 years ago. Absolutely, and we're still dealing with the same nonsense. The 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 schools are just as uh, as uh, segregated as they as they were before. And uh, there's a direct correlation to how many black kids are in school and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and the amount of money that goes to those schools. I mean, you can draw, there's a direct correlation between the number of black kids that are in the school and how low the financial commitment is to that institution. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And even when they go to, to integrated schools, black kids are still at the bottom, right? So if you don't sit correctly in your chair, or you don't say whatever it is to that person that's standing in the room, you're gonna get sent out of the room. Imagine what happens to you when you're not in a school, much education you miss when you're not in the room or get expelled or something, like, whatever it is. It's, so, so when we moved down from the DC area to, uh, to uh, North Carolina, we investigated the schools very well. We investigated the police force and uh, that was one of the major reasons that we, we came down. The police force had a, had a wonderful reputation uh, in, in this area. Uh, the airport here in Raleigh Durham is one of the cheapest in the airport in the, uh, in the country. And uh, there seemed to be a good opportunity at race relations. It was interesting. I hired a consultant to say, I said, look, we need to be on the East Coast. Uh, find me a place. And uh, I told her what we were looking for. And she went and she came back and she said it was Raleigh. And I said, that's in the South. <laughs> nah, I am not doing do it. And she said, at least go down and check it out. So in 98, I, I drove, I came down here and uh, took her, I, she got a hotel room and I was just checking things out. And I remember uh, I, I stopped to get some grocery and uh, I was going to just eat, eat in my room. And I was walking around and the first thing that crossed my mind is I said, you know, are, is there somebody that looks like me? 
that that is that is around town because people are walking up and speaking to me like they know me and you know I'm standing in line and this woman came up behind me and she put her arms around me and she said uh, she said oh baby you you I see you getting all, all those fruits and vegetables you need to get some ice cream like me <laughs> and I'm thinking you know you know just I you know I got very defensive but I just started to realize that people were very open the people were very friendly well I fell in love with the place and that's why we why we ended up moving here Durham, but when we did Durham. Durham. <laughs> Durham. <laughs> I said hey we love we love Durham too and uh and I live right on the Raleigh Durham line but uh, but anyway uh when we when when I came down that was what I was exposed to uh my kids came out of the talented and gifted program in 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 schools both of them did very well academically but when we went to the school that they said was so great uh, what we ran into was, you know, over the summer, we had the kids go to NC State. They went through the summer enrichment program. Both of them won awards for, you know, academic achievement. We got to the high, got to the school. I mean, they were terrorizing my oldest son. I mean, oh, well, we want to, you know, we think that he can't, you know, it was one teacher uh, was saying, uh, we don't think he can read. We don't think he can read. You know, he he could read in the first grade. <laughs> what are you talking about? But it was just all of this opposition, just one right after another. And uh, I finally made the decision that we needed to move the kids over to Southeast. Uh, um. <laughs> and uh, we went ahead and, uh, but, you know, some of the, 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 with that school that they said was so great, was great for some kids. They weren't good for my kids. Yeah. But, uh it was an, it was a very valuable lesson to help me to understand some of the challenges that we have in our in our school system so absolutely well thank you so much for chatting with me this has been sure absolutely thing. wonderful when we finish chatting can you stay online for just one minute sure. um, and as soon as the video re converts i'll send you a link so you can look at it and see if there's anything we need to do differently than what we did fantastic so much thank you um um i i, I must tell you i'm i'm more impressed than i was and we talked earlier before i mean like i, I <laughs> much accomplished um well-rounded you know absolutely fair-minded absolutely wonderful man so thank you so much for now becoming a part of my community so um you know i'm claiming you too so thank you so much for doing this thank, thank you very thank very you very much thank you okay so i I'm appreciate end the this opportunity recording. absolutely i'm going to end this recording and i just have two questions for you hold on okay